Let's talk about Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I wasn't going to go into this topic, but I realized I have a bit of a unique perspective just due to some of my previous jobs. And ultimately, I wanted to try to give a bit more perspective. So I haven't been a server admin, but I have worked closely with server and application admins at companies that used Rail. Let's take a quick look at what all of the uproar is about. So as you can see here, this is the article that kind of sent the Linux world into a bit of a storm. Essentially, this is saying that the old CentOS repo that had the RHEL source code will no longer be available. So CentOS Stream will be the sole repository for public RHEL. It does mention you can still access the RHEL source code via the Red Hat customer portal, meaning if you have a support contract or if you have a developer license. With that out of the way, some people may be thinking, okay, I don't really care about RHEL. Why even use RHEL? And if you're outside the corporate world, I completely understand where you're coming from. But I did want to point out that there are some very good reasons to use RHEL in the corporate world, and here are four of them. First up is support. If you run an app that makes your company money, being down is simply not an option. Being down for an hour may cost hundreds of thousands of dollars or even millions of dollars, depending on the company. Uptime really matters for some of these applications in use. To give a bit of perspective on what is expected of rail support, if you have a severity one ticket, which is the highest level you can submit, it's like if your system is down or it's resulting in data loss in your production system, someone at Red Hat has to reply within an hour. For standard contracts, that is during business hours for premium customers, that is 24 seven, 365. They have to respond just even just saying, hey, I have your ticket. They have to do that within an hour. And after that initial response, every hour, they should be reaching back out. That is the service level agreement for REL customers. And you'll see here on the screen, I have severity two, three, and four and all that. But the, the important one is that severity one. That's what people are really gonna be concerned about. That is often the times when you're gonna need REL support the most. So the second reason is that software may require it. So some companies that release enterprise level software may require a specific Linux distribution to get support from that company. So I'm sure most people won't wanna hear this company name, but I will say it. Oracle requires you to generally have Red Hat Enterprise Linux for some of their products. And likewise, SAP, I believe they require SUSE. So, there are companies out there where if you are buying an enterprise level product, you have to have a specific Linux distribution to run that on to get support for that. And if you've just spent lots and lots of money on one of these and you're going to be using this for the next 5, 10, 20 years, you want to make sure you have that support. And just to drive this home, I mean, sometimes literally in the license agreement, it is going to state like what the system that is running the product needs to run for support. And that's one reason that companies will run something like RHEL and pay for the support for that, as opposed to trying to run something like Debian or Fedora or Rocky Linux or something like that. Stability is the next one. And it's not exclusive to RHEL, but RHEL is among those that generally is considered one of the most stable. Their distros update very slowly, their software is generally ancient. But in an environment where you need to control as much as possible and their engineers need to know as much as possible about the environment, this is a very good thing. I believe the current support cycle for a RHEL version is 10 years. So the next time a version of RHEL comes out, if you install it, you have 10 years of service on that particular version. I think this is one of the reasons Canonical has ended up going to the 10 year model for some of the Ubuntu LTS releases. I think you have to have Pro or something like that. But ultimately that I believe is one of the reasons to try to match what Red Hat is doing with RHEL. And last that I'm gonna list here is size. While doing research for a different video, I ended up looking up how much Red Hat had sold for, how much Canonical was worth. And well, the difference was a little surprising. 
What would you say if I told you that Red Hat was valued at three times more than Canonical? Would that seem like a reasonable answer? What if I told you that Red Hat was valued at 10 times more than Canonical? Would that be reasonable? Let's try to look at this number a little bit more closely. So Canonical's a private company. We don't have as detailed information of how much it would be worth. I do have an article here where they're quoting 700 million to 3 billion if somebody wanted to acquire Canonical. And this is a couple years old, but a lot of the data we have is, is a couple years old. SUSE, meanwhile, has a market cap of $2.6 billion. And so, you know, that could be double what Canonical's worth, or that could be just a little under what Canonical's worth. We don't really know right now. But similar ballpark at the least. So Red Hat was sold in 2019. So we know exactly how much they were worth at the time. And that was 34 billion dollars. So anywhere between 10 times and maybe even 30 times as much as Canonical. I don't think most people really realize how much bigger of a company Red Hat is compared to basically any other Linux company out there. And while this may not seem like an important factor to you, this is a huge deal for big companies that want to make sure that their products are properly supported. And of course, it also gives Red Hat leverage, well, now IBM leverage, to try to work out deals with those software providers to make sure it runs well on Red Hat at the least. Now, let's just wrap this up because for most users, this is not gonna be a big deal. Most people are not running Red Hat Enterprise Linux at their house or their home lab. They may be running Rocky or Alma if they're more into the Red Hat ecosystem. But will companies switch away from RHEL? Tough to say. Smaller companies, maybe so. But bigger companies, probably not. Because again, hundreds of thousands of dollars per hour could be on the line, if not millions of dollars an hour. And I already expect that most of those enterprise size companies already have several contracts with Red Hat. In the article at the beginning, they kind of hint at that it doesn't really make sense anymore to keep the old Cent OS repo alive. And that's where people were able to view the RHEL source code. So they're kind of just saying, oh, hey, you know, it doesn't really make sense for us to do this anymore. But I'm really curious, do they have any metrics that are suggesting that this is something that they should do? Are they expecting any kind of return on this? Because I, I don't know the answer to that. And I doubt anybody outside of IBM or Red Hat know the answer to that. It also makes me wonder what are gonna happen to Rocky Linux and Alma Linux? They're supposed to be a one-to-one -one kind of match for RHEL. And so are they still gonna be a thing? We don't really know. I touched on this earlier, but if you have a developer license, you can go in and freely get the Red Hat Enterprise Linux source code. But it's unclear right now if that would allow Rocky and Alma to keep going. Though based on the customer agreements, it doesn't seem like it. While this move won't affect me personally, it does seem like a questionable move at best, if not a bad move. I also wonder if there's gonna be any fallout for projects that are closely associated with Red Hat. I'm not saying directly from the Red Hat side, I'm saying from more the user side. I'm wondering if people are going to, you know, try to step away from some of those projects because of this move. So far, I haven't really seen that, but I haven't really been looking either. So what are your thoughts? Is this something where people are blowing this out of proportion or do you think the response that we've seen so far has been warranted? I'm kind of indifferent at the moment. I'm kind of still waiting to see and think through everything, but I think with some time, we'll get some more clarity on what exactly this all means. One thing I will say though, is that Red Hat should have done a better job at communicating this. The post itself, really made people unsure of what was going on at first. And at this point, we just have a lot of questions that we don't really have answers to. So as always, thanks for watching, have a great day, and I will see you next time.